Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help around the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope that what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. Hello, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Oh, whatever, we're not we're gonna go at it. Um, listeners of Positive Filter, uh, we have a very exciting episode. Um, we are filming this episode live. I am with my special guest today, and um, I just wanted to give a little background. This guest is my new, uh, well, I say new, but we're both new colleague to uh, George Mason University, and I just had to get her on the podcast because. She exudes a positive attitude. Um, since day one, she has really um, brought up the whole spirit of the whole team here. And it just was her energy um, made everyone around her work better. Um, but what also uh, drew me to her to be a guest is that she's extremely tall and she, she's a D1 basketball player, a baller. So I had to get her on, a, on the podcast to... Um, Tell about her journey in Division One basketball, which is you know something really cool. So on the podcast today, I have Christy Michaels. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Phil. Very happy to be here. Yeah, that was that was, that was quite the intro. I practiced <laughs> that like three times last night, and it didn't. Um, from what I'm saying, it didn't come out like I thought in my head. But this is my first podcast, so I'm very excited. Yeah, so we, we're going to make this. Uh, you know, we we go as we go. So um, I explain to everyone um, that you're a Division One basketball player, but I want to give you an opportunity to tell a little bit about your uh, career journey and your and your basketball journey um, for the listeners. Okay. Um, it started when I was about eight years old. It was when I first started playing um, collective sports. Uh, my, my older sister, Stephanie, she's um, six years older than me. She started playing and... Um, I kind of admired the the dedication she would always uh, put into playing. We had um, an outdoor hoop that she would always be shooting at, and it was funny because she was way taller than me at the time since I was only eight years old, and she would never let me lower the basket because um, it would she would have to take the time to to raise it back up. So ever since I was really little, I would just be using all my energy to shoot at the tall hoop. Um, but I, I admired her dedication. So shout out to Stephanie. I know she'll be listening to this. Oh, she will? Yeah, I told okay. her about it. So, so we, got, we got about like two listeners. <laughs> we got two fans of the podcast. Chris, Christy is probably like my only fan of the podcast. She, oh, she no. gives me lots of positive feedback to keep me going. So now we got a uh, shout out to your sister. She, she'll, she'll definitely, like, definitely. Too. Um, but yeah, ever since I was eight years old, I've been playing and... Uh, it was really cool. My dad, he was invested too. My parents were always very supportive. Uh, we actually, my dad and I, we drew the three-point line, the arc on my driveway. So that was always my favorite place to be, right on my driveway, shooting hoops. Um, all you need is a, a basket and a ball. Hard work and dedication will take you a long way. But then um, I was playing in high school. I played travel basketball. I uh, jumped around teams a while, um, just trying to find the right coach, the right connection. And eventually it led me to get a full scholarship at the University of Hartford in Connecticut, where I played basketball for four years. Had a great time there. Played for Jennifer Rosati, who is a, an amazing coach. Um, she's actually now the head coach at George Washington. So she, she moved to, um, which is awesome, because now that she's local and I'm local, I'm able to still stay in touch with her and watch the games. Uh, but she's she's taught me so much about the basketball game, um, the the thinking that goes behind all the plays and the strategy behind it all. Um, I had some really good ha uh, coaches in high school as well that pushed me to be the best that I could be and um, helped me get to where I, I ended up. So you said uh, your the, your college coach, um, and I don't want to murder her name, but um, she is local, and I remember you told me a story. She's in the. Um, she was a UConn player, mm -hmm. correct? She so played she, for Gino Ariyama. So, so she's in the family. So, you know, that was a big mentorship for you, and she probably had mentorship for her, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's pretty amazing. So, 
Now that athletics is done, would you say you still have a passion for basketball? Oh, definitely. I could never give it up. I play, uh, I try to play two to three times a week still, honestly. Um, I joined a rec league. Um, I play co-ed on campus, anywhere, anywhere I can get a game in. I, I love to play. Yeah, you try to invite me to play, but I told you my, <laughs> my game is trash bags, so I did not take you up on an invitation. I might, I might still, you know, try to play you in 21 or horse, <laughs> but, you know, I ain't trying to show how trash I am in basketball. It's, it's an outlet for me, <laughs> for sure. Um, on the weeks that I'm really emotional or um, my mental state isn't there, if I can go play basketball, it helps me de-stress. It helps me forget about the the stuff that's going on in my head. Um, and I can tell, like, weeks that I don't get to go play basketball, my, my energy um, and my, my positive side isn't always there because I'm not doing what I love, and basketball is something that I love. And you still have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you talked about, you know, um, traveling and travel league and high school and then, you know, actually Division One basketball. Um, you know, some of the things I see with the kids nowadays is they get uh, what we, you know, like, athletic burnout you know mm -hmm. um the parents hyper focus on one sport and make them play that so much because you know we see that you know the level of talent is harder so if you don't play all the time you're not going to keep up or you know what i believe I, I think that kids should play multiple different sports mm -hmm. even if they have a the best one um did you ever get a feeling of that burnout like i play basketball all the time I, this is not that much fun for me um, they put too much energy in basketball. Did you ever feel like that growing up? Growing up? Um, every once in a while, yeah. Maybe when things weren't going my way, when um, I wasn't playing my best or I wasn't getting the playing time that I wanted, um, I would get down on myself. Um, a lot of times my parents were there to pick me up. They were always very supportive. But those, luckily those droughts never lasted long because, uh, again, if I, if I was upset with my performance, I would go outside and shoot. It was up to me to improve myself and to get the, uh, if I wanted more playing time, I had to work to get it. So it kind of, it, I would get down in the dumps every once in a while, but it fueled me to get out there and, and get back up and try again. That's really cool. So when you, when you got up in the dumps, uh, I mean, you know, you're doing it, um, you know, what would be your mindset if you felt down, like you weren't really feeling basketball for that moment? You said your family supported you. What were some things that you did to reframe that? Uh, a lot of times it was my team, too. Some of the teams that um, I didn't mesh as well with, with my, um, my teammates, uh, I, I could just tell that it wasn't a good fit. So um, in times when I struggled, I would, I would look and see my teammates out there at practice and say, I got I to gotta do better for them. So the more connection I had with them off the court, the more motivated I was to improve myself and improve my skills so that as a team we could um, collectively get better. So that's why I think that um, I jumped around teams for a while because I was trying to find that connection that I was willing to go to battle with my teammates. I love that. I love that model, the, the word going to battle. So, you know, um, I know a lot of people, especially me, uh, shout out, I'm going to plug myself a little bit. I, I ran one semester of college track. That's good. That's I, good. Obviously, you don't see that aesthetically now. <laughs> um, you know, but you still got there. I, I got there, uh, I, and I was running track. And for me, and and this is total transparent, um, I didn't have a love for track. <laughs> like I actually hated running. I don't like running. Um, it, that's not a sport that people really in, like. Say, you know what? I love just running so much. Um, but I, what I love the most about track. Uh, which wouldn't be a surprise, was the social aspect. Right. I loved track practice, and not track practice for running, but just hanging out with people the and people. having fun. Um, it was just like my social outlet. Um, I remember, shout out to my coach, Coach Jackson from high school. He'd be like, Philip, get more serious. Like, you know, you're laughing too much. And he was like, if you want to go home, you're not going to take this serious, you know, leave the track. And I'm like, okay. And I start walking out and he says, I'm just joking, get back on the line. And so, like, I never took anything too serious. Uh, that's just not my mindset. And I think that's probably why I get in trouble professionally now. It's like, I don't take life too seriously, but I love social, social. I love being around people. I love the team aspect. Um, can you speak upon uh, that desire for team and, and, was basketball for you a really social thing? 
It was growing up for sure. I um I got along well with the the players that I had in high school, um, the teammates that I had in high school. So it was nice to see those friends in the hallways, uh, see those friends in class, hang out with them on the weekend. I mean, you spend so much time with them that uh, if you don't like the players that you're with, um, it, it might not be a good outlet for you and you might not want to continue down that path. So I was very fortunate that um, growing up, I've had some really good uh, teammates that I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed and been able to stay in touch with them um, long after high school, long long after our travel days. Um, I have so many group texts with different with different teams mm. that it's really cool to see that bond that we all put put in um, that it created such a good long lasting bond. Yeah, and you know, you know, speaking as a Division One athlete, or me also speaking upon my social outlets. Do you think you actively seek that team mindset with work? Oh, definitely. Um, it helps me with my sense of purpose. If I see my neighbor working hard, it, it pushes me to work hard as well. Um, and on the flip side, when I'm putting in extra hours and I see other people just lackadaisically walking around, it, it does bother me um, because I think that we're all here for the same reason. Um, and some sometimes you'll notice that, that people aren't there for the right reasons. But that's something that drew me to George Mason was that um, our department here, everyone has the right goal in mind. Everyone wants to serve the students, um, make, make the the place around us better. So it's nice to see that my colleagues here are so driven to perform their best because they know that it'll improve the lives of people around them. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I definitely uh, was telling someone earlier that, you know, when you got it added on and we started getting more more and more uh, employees here at, at Career Services, it feels to me like a team. Um, and it feels like athletically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I joke around and say, Maybe this is our championship year <laughs> because our events are doing really well and it feels like we're gelling. And um, I definitely get that team vibe here, you know, like, um, and I think the things that I draw from that is like usually a team with the championship mentality is like you have a goal, like the goal is to win mm -hmm. and win a championship. Um, you have roles and role players and positions like, you know, people on the bench, even they have a role, you know, to support. Definitely. Um, so even the people that are more outgoing, um, have a role, but also the people that support them behind the scenes have a role, and I feel like that's a team mentality. And then also, like you said, that purpose of of knowing what the goal is. Our goal is to serve Mason students the best we can. It feels like we have an agenda, and we all are on board with that. Um, but like the team mentality, we also have the informal camaraderie, and you know, uh, trivia nights, mm -hmm. and um, joking, and 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 just being. I, I believe bringing yourself to to this work environment, as you would hope that you can bring your full self to an athletic team. Like you can be, you can be Christy on the basketball team, mm -hmm. and that same Christy could be the same Christy that you bring to other aspects of your life. And I feel the same way. Like I can be Phil here, but also can be Phil in the team of, of career services. Right. That, I love that analogy because. Uh, just like in sports, we're, we put in so many hours in this office that you see the same people day in and day out. You see them at their best. You see them at their worst. And at the end of the day, we're a family. We're here working hard together that we're going to pick each other up. I'm not going to let you uh, you fail. If you ever needed help, I'm always there to help you. I'm there to pick you up. And I know that all of our neighbors in the office would do the same. Um, it's funny when you talk about championships. Right before the career fair week, I got nervous. I had butterflies in my stomach. I couldn't sleep as well because it was my first time experiencing that that season. And just like just like athletics, you have you have those different seasons. You have the on period, you have the off period. Um, and so over summer, that was our off period. We were all working in, uh, working hard, putting in the work, doing professional development, traveling to improve ourselves, to again improve our department all leading up to our largest career fair in the fall, which is a week long, um, we have week long mm -hmm. events. And so you have to have that energy. You have to bring your A game. You have to uh, be prepared. All that work leading up to the biggest week, we were putting in the preparation, mm -hmm. um, leaning on each other, supporting each other, motivating each other so that we would execute and perform the best we could. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you you know, you know, in that championship or that week, you know, it felt like we had many games. Mm -hmm. And like your game that you took lead on was the resume clinic and mine was the JC Penney's mm -hmm. event. And I ain't gonna lie, I felt just as nervous as you did. And it felt like it was it was that whole summer was my preseason and this was my game. Exactly. Like, and it felt like a game, like, you know, like 
I felt like we had a score. Like it, oh, yeah. It literally, it, um, it was one of the few times in work, and I think that's, that speaks to the office culture that we have here, where it felt like I mentally put myself into this activity or this event, and it mattered to me like a game would matter to Definitely. me. Definitely. Um, and I, you know, I, being totally transparent, I haven't really felt that career-wise for a long time, maybe ever, feeling so vested in something. And then this J.C. Penney's event felt like my championship, you know. And and I loved that when we actually did it, we were, you know, we were hyped and mm-hmm. we had energy. And that's the same thing you need for basketball. You need energy. You need hype. Uh, it literally felt like a sports team. And I. I I definitely got that vibe. And then, you know, and as you said earlier, we had other games that we, you know, games as in right. resume clinic and an actual career fair. And it sucked out energy out of us, you know. Um, even I, being an extrovert, was like, even after the career fair, I was like, yo, I'm burnt out. Like, it felt like we, we played a sport. Like, mm-hmm. like, yeah, it was exhausting. It was exhausting. <laughs> and so, but it was so rewarding because you were able to trust each other and, yeah. and see the the success that we can bring when we all work together and bring our A-game. Yeah. So I would say, um, you know, we kind of jumped around, but what are some struggles you think that you or other Division One athletes have once the playing days are over? And we spoke offline. Why didn't you continue your athletic career? Right. Okay. So um, when I was a senior in uh, undergrad, I was thinking, okay, what's next for me? Um, like most college athletes you want to continue playing your sport and want to play um, at the highest level possible so I actually had the thought of playing overseas for a while mm-hmm. um, I, I played with the idea for a little bit but realized that it just wasn't the path for me um, I was burnt out honestly it mm-hmm. was it was tough four years um, I, I mentioned to you we never won a championship so I was kind of deflated with that um, mm-hmm. I loved the time I put in. I loved my teammates, and I would never do anything differently. But I was so deflated from those four years um, that I decided I needed to take a break mm-hmm. uh, mentally and physically. And honestly, now I realize that was a good choice because <laughs> my body is aging, and mm-hmm. I can't run, I can't play like I used to. And so I'm glad that I gave my body that break so I can still um, get back out there on the court now and play for fun and still have the love that I have for the game but I I'll, I will admit that after those 4 years the 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 love was still there but I just could I needed to take a break. I needed to separate myself for a little bit. So two things where in Europe were you interested in? Um the place that I was looking to was actually England. There was mm-hmm. um I found a program where I could get my I could go to grad school and play at the same oh, time. Wow, that's dope. Um but I was thinking financially, I don't I don't know if I'm ready to commit that mm-hmm. type of funds and um put myself in debt like that. Mm-hmm. Um I did the I am a little bit upset that I didn't fully think out the idea because um, a big part of me wants to travel. I want to go abroad and mm-hmm. visit other places, but I decided that I'd rather have a peace of mind financially and um, get get some work experience under my feet, build up some some finances, and then be able to go um, explore and enjoy um, enjoy traveling. And also, I, I'd like to do it with someone else. I don't want to just go by myself. I, I'd rather spend those experiences with some people that I love. Yeah, and, and obviously, if you didn't make that choice, I always think about things happen for reasons. And you exactly. Wouldn't be, you wouldn't be here on this podcast Absolutely. today, right? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you made the right choice because you're on my podcast. <laughs> right. But um, definitely, <laughs> after, after I decided not to go that route, um, it's something that I still struggle with, honestly, is identity. And you'll hear athletes mm-hmm. talk about it time and time mm-hmm. again because that's all I knew growing up, basketball, basketball, mm-hmm. basketball. Um, obviously, I was dedicated to my studies. I, I put the work in, in the classroom. Um, mm-hmm. I got my degrees, but that's not something that I was passionate about. I was only ever passionate about basketball, I'd really mm-hmm. say. Um, and obviously, I'm very tall, so that's something that people identify with me, too. Uh, mm-hmm. That's a lot. Uh, a lot of the times when I meet someone, they'll say, oh, you're really tall. Did you play a sport? Already off and, the break. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I own it. I mean, I love it. I love that that's my identifier. But at the same time, when my playing that days were over, uh, it was yeah. really hard for me to figure out what's the next step for me. What am I going to put my passion into now? Um, I can still play for fun, but for a career, for for my life, I need to find a new direction, and I didn't know where to start. So, I mean, you talked about a lot of things, um, the, the struggles of D- Division One athletes, and you know, it's the bigger picture. Um, you know, uh, you know, the NCAA and all that. It, it creates a lot of opportunities for students to get education, mm-hmm. and we know for certain certain groups, and I'm going to speak a little bit upon certain. Um, ethnic groups 
they use sports as a way to get out of their of their um, situation impoverished situations mm -hmm. um, and and along with that um, not in your case you know you had that focus on you know maybe edu education was more primary than secondary because you were more I, when I look at your accomplishments and your honor roll and all that you were a student athlete and more like student first athlete mm -hmm. second um, what are some things that you see because I know you worked in athletics that is that struggle for a lot of students, you know, especially students of color, um, that struggle with that, the flip that coin mm -hmm. of being student first and athlete second? Because as we know, only like what, 0.1%, I don't know the, the mathematical <laughs> thing, but not that many people make it to the next level. Right. You know, um, I got some, I even got one of my closest friends that played, uh, Justin Bell, shout out to him. He played Division One football at Boston College, but obviously he got injured. And so, that derailed his, you know, baller dreams. Mm -hmm. And so he had to reframe um, what he was interested in and all those things. I know that was a big struggle for him. So can you speak upon those people that are using um, college sports to get out of a situation, mm -hmm. but then once they're in college, they still struggle with being an athlete, I mean, a student first, then an athlete. Definitely. Uh, the past two years, I was a graduate assistant um, at East Tennessee State University down in Johnson City, Tennessee. Shout out to my people down there. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I was doing academic advising for the athletic department. And there, um, I saw a whole new side of things because I was on the other side of athletics. Um, mm -hmm. I was no longer the student athlete, but I was the one mentoring and guiding the student athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can definitely see um, across the board, this is something that a lot of student athletes struggle with, is that they identify with the sport they play. Growing up in high school, their coaches, their family, their friends, they would congratulate them on wins, they would go to their games, they would be so supportive of, the, of them athletically, but mm -hmm. a lot of the times, no one gets the support academically, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes in high school, um, some, some teachers might even give students um, easy passes or, hall mm -hmm. or free passes mm -hmm. because they won their game last night. Sure, yeah, you can turn in something late. Mm -hmm. um, so they're able to not necessarily cheat the system, but the system works for them in a way to promote them athletically, not promote them scholarly. And what I've heard there is that it sets up a system that is not realistic of work, work mm -hmm. expectations. So mm -hmm. they get these passes for turning in late work and sliding through and passing through. But then when the real world hits them and they're not playing sports no more, they don't have those uh, advantages anymore. Right. And it, it sets them up to rely on their athletic talents to get them places, mm -hmm. which in some, some, some situations it will, but not all. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely more than none will. I mean, yeah, more, uh, more people will not play professionally than those that will. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important to support people um, in their full lives, not just the sport that they play, but to um, celebrate their successes off the court as well. When they turn in a paper on time, congratulate them. Mm -hmm. When they get a good grade, congratulate them. When they put the work in, congratulate them. Because it's everyone's success academically will come at different measures. Not everyone's mm -hmm. going to be straight A students, right. but just to be able to, and, and that goes with comparing yourself. You don't want to compare yourself to your neighbor, but yeah. just put in the work and do the best that you can. Judge yourself on the grades that you're getting. If you got a C one day, try to get better the next day. Um, and, and they need support too. The student athletes, um, the ones that are struggling, they they need help. They need people to be picking them up and being positive about their um, scholastic studies. Yeah, I mean that kind of, and you know, I like we like to throw people in on a positive club, but that kind of that whole story kind of alludes to our our colleague, our friend Megan, mm -hmm. and how um, she celebrates her student athlete success. And one success I remember specifically was she was so excited that a student just did better on writing notes. Exactly. It wasn't even in the classroom. It was just the, the note-taking style switched, and she was just so impressed. And I think that goes along with sh her preparing the students for real-world successes and small things, like being able to take notes and, and analyze your reading. That was a huge success. That's going to be a, 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 a huge benefit for that student mm -hmm. in the future beyond the sport of basketball or football or whatever mm -hmm. that student played but it's a big success and that something that she took a lot of pride in right I know she gets so excited when her student athletes will come back and take voluntarily take notes without her having to remind them or ask mm -hmm. them because that shows that they're committed that they're dedicated to doing things the right way they know that they're, they're starting to learn that 
in order to get a good grade on a paper, you can't just write it the night before. You have to pay attention in class. You have to put in the work. You have to want to take those notes so, th so that down the road, it'll help you. All right, so I was thinking, um, what were, you know, you're, now you're in the career field. You're, a, you're an employer's relations person. <laughs> what are some lessons you can tell other D1 athletes, not scholarly but career-wise, the D some career tips for these student athletes and D1 athletes? Or D2, mm -hmm. any college athletes. So we're not going to just say D1 athletes. Right, right. So um, a lot of times coaches will tell you that you have to put in extra work, right? So you get X amount of hours on the court with the coaches for practice um, to prepare for games. But if you want to excel, if you want to find success, you have to put in extra work outside of those hours. And a lot of times you have to put in work when no one's supervising you. You're going to be on your own. Um, just you and a hoop, or you can you can ask your neighbors for help to come to come practice with you. But there's a lot of unsupervised work that needs to be done in the off hours um, in order for you to succeed. Similarly, in the work world, you don't have someone um, over your shoulder telling you do this drill next, do that drill next. So you have to want to get better. You have to want to provide the the work to to be excellent at, at whatever task you're doing. So having that self drive definitely. Self drive, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then, uh, sorry, dang. Um, <laughs> so some of the things I also thought about, um, you know, your positive attitude it exudes. You know, no one's going to not say uh, Chrissy is not a positive person. Um, has that positivity um, kind of bit you in the butt? Um, first, say I'll give my example. Uh, I like to be happy and be positive um, by exuding that on Facebook and social media, and then just smiling and stuff but then people think that maybe I'm phony um, I get that response like uh, maybe your positivity is not genuine you can't be that happy all the time mm -hmm. um, and 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 you know most recently I'm very transparent you know I do share that I do have struggles and I'm just like everybody else in regards to that but I exude this positivity because for me the the, the if I outwardly show that I'm positive even if I'm somewhat struggling it almost turns me positive, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. I, it's that that fake it till you make it sense. sense. Right. But the, the problem with that fake it till you make it sense is people may not know that you struggle like them, or people may not, like I said, think that your positivity is genuine. But you, you're a very positive person. That's what attracted me to get you on the podcast. I said I had to get you on here to talk about your D1 things because it's your positive attitude. But have you had any obstacles with that? Definitely. Um that's something that I take pride in, my positivity. Um, I've never been the best on the team. I've never been the best in the classroom. I've always just been probably above average because of the work that I put in, not because of my um, God-gifted talents. I, I'm not athletic. I was, I was the tallest one on my team with the worst vertical, right? Yeah. So, like, my athletic ability is not there. I had to put in the work to get to where I was. Um, but because I was never the best, I tried to find ways that I could prov I could be the best somewhere else, right? So I wanted to always be the most positive person on the team. I always wanted to be the most supportive. And that's something that I do in life, too. Um, I have three older sisters. I love them so much. And I try to be as supportive as possible because I want to be their personal cheerleader. I want to celebrate their successes. I want to push them to find new successes. Once they reach a new height, go to the next one. I want to always be there pushing people to be the best that they can be. Um, and that's why I've always tried to be a positive person so that my energy can rub off on other people so that they can continue to be successful um, in ways that I might not be able to. Um, so like in college, some of, the, some of the plays that I was incapable of doing just because of my abilities, I wanted to... Help, I still wanted to help my team. I still wanted to help my teammates. And so I would give them that positive encouragement to, to that was my part and contribution to, to that certain play. So you talked about your attitude and your positivity. Can you speak upon when that, not saying that bit you in the butt, but it was an obstacle or it was just interpreted, interpretate, oh uh, gosh, interpret, <laughs> interpret it in a different way that mm -hmm. you didn't foresee. Right. Um, yeah, I, I did have a coach one time sit me down and say, look, Christy, it really annoys me when you come in after a loss and you're smiling and clapping and laughing with your teammates the next day at practice. And 
at the time, I didn't realize what the point of our conversation was, but I was being told that I was being too positive when that particular coach was still still caught up in the loss the night before that they needed a longer time to cope than I did because mm-hmm. for me, I've always been very easygoing. Um, I'll brush things off my shoulders super quickly and I won't let it, I don't want things to linger on my mm-hmm. mental state. So um, I'm quick to turn a new page and that's something that I've always taken pride in. So when I was told I was being too positive, it really made me question, am I not as committed as my my teammate to the right of me, do I care less because I'm mm-hmm. not focusing on the loss from last night? But I just realized that it, it, it takes people different times to cope with things. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it takes little to no yeah. time to, to get over something. Right. Yes, there's definitely a time that you need to grief or reflect upon mm-hmm. why things went the wrong way. Right. But as soon as you're done with that with that reflection, you need to close the book and move on. You need to turn the page and uh, go on to the next thing because there's no point in dwelling on what happened in the past. You can't change that. And I think I like that. I love that mentality, separation of separation of upbeatness and happy and, and jovial from t- committing to something. Like, as you said, like my coach, Coach Jackson, he, even though he gives me a hard time, um, about that, you know, he knew that I still came to practice, right? Mm-hmm. And I, that's just my attitude. Like, I don't take things too seriously. But the thing, the thing about that, not taking things too seriously, in my attitude, does not mean that if I want something to go well, I care. Like, so, mm-hmm. I, I, I definitely get in trouble for that too. You know, even, you know, sometimes with with Maggie, just friends in general, like take the. <laughs> Get serious, folks. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> like, but on the flip side, it's like I am committed. I'm serious. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm involved. Uh, I just have a weird way of showing it, and it's just my way. Like, it, it, I like to laugh. Oh, and I like to I like to joke. And the thing is, but if someone was like, Philip, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Even if I'm joking or laughing, I'm gonna do it. Mm-hmm. And that's I think that's just my approach. And sometimes, even for me in general. I know a lot of people say this, um, you know, humor is my way of coping with hard adversity. Um, I like to turn things and laugh at even, you know, even I laugh at even bad situations. Um, For me, it's just my positive coping mechanism to like, if I still can find something funny out of this bad situation, it helps me. And if that's what works for you, yeah. It helps me cope. But okay, and you'll realize that like it's almost that's that mindset like you notice a lot of comedians are the most depressed people or things like that. Mm-hmm. They use that humor, they use that way to uh, express themselves. But they definitely they still you know when Chris Rock or Jay Chappelle talk about like some racial thing and they make it a funny joke, I bet it's still underneath. There's it's a serious. They still feel some pain. Yeah, right. and it's a, and there's still a seriousness there. So with that being said, you know. I think that we both can be upbeat, positive people and have that be clearly separated from us committing Mm -hmm. to the work. And I think that's understanding people's differences. So Mm -hmm. personality, coping mechanisms, different is different. One way is not better than the other. One way is not right. One way is not wrong. But you choose, everything's a choice, right? You So you still choose to show up to practice, smiling or not. You still choose to show up to work, to put in, put in the work. Uh, everything's a choice. So just choosing to show up that day is step one of the commitment. What you do next is just, it's how everyone's different. That's cool. So I think we got, I mean, you know, usually my episodes are longer, you know, but I think maybe we can flip it and talk a little bit. I want to do my, now it's kind of appropriate. Like Marty said it was shot for shot, like <laughs> liquor or whatever. I don't know. But now, now I guess, we're hooping. Now we're hooping. <laughs> my, I want to, I wish we were actually at a basketball court playing <laughs> horse doing this, but um, let's do our shot for shot uh, for the listeners that don't know. That's my opportunity. Shout out to Marty. Cause now I'm using it every episode. Marty. Um, shot for shot. Uh, you get to ask me a question. I get to ask you a question. Totally not even relevant to basketball or it could be relevant to basketball, right. whatever. Uh, do you want to go first? I'll go first. Um, I'll go first because okay. I, I was thinking of one. You were thinking um, of one? Yeah. Oh, snap. So yeah. I remember when we did our, our first meeting, our one-on-one meeting to figure out who's Phil, who's Christy, who am I working with, um, mm-hmm. something you told me was that you used to power lift and that you're looking to get back into that. Oh, um, and more recently, you're talking about TED Talks, right? So these are these goals, these ambitions that you have, yeah. and that is so awesome. I think it's great that you have something that you're working towards um, and acknowledging the fact that you're, you're, you're striving for something in the future. So my question for you is, um, what, are your, what are some of your goals, and how do you plan on achieving those goals? Like prioritizing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Well, as you see, I keep on saying to everyone, even my powerlifting friends, I'm going to get in the gym. So I need to stop lying and just go run, or just like just get in the car and go. Um, but I don't have any powerlifting goals. I don't have any ideas. I don't have any. I don't even have a goal to compete, um, which was helpful for me back in the day. I used to love signing up for these powerlifting meets, and then that would force me to work out. Like I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Most I'm one of the most lazy exercisers of all time. I don't like working out, <laughs> um, but I like showing up. <laughs> like, so for me, I didn't. Really, I never liked track practice, but I love the meets. You know, I love the the final product. I really didn't like lifting or doing all these sets in five by five, but I love, like, this is attention seeking behavior. This is Philip, so surprise, surprise. I love uh, getting that one or two deadlifts in a competition and everyone's staring at me. I, I ate that attention up. That's pressure, you like, yeah, you like I, to work under pressure. I like, I like attention pressure. Yeah, <laughs> I, like, yeah. I, like, I like a stage, <laughs> a stage of something. I'm not an actor, but I love being on a stage. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I, I don't know if me signing up for some kind of athletic event, like a powerlifting meet or something, will give me a drive to get back in it. I'm, I'm examining that. And that's, I think that kind of correlates with the TED Talk, too. Like, I want to get better at public speaking. Um, I, I don't think I'm the best at it. Um, I, I try to treat every little presentation that I do in, in career services as a, a practice for public speaking. But I want to I wanna do public speaking. That's something I, I set as a new goal for myself. And so one way, you know, similar to powerlifting, one way I feel like is a concrete example of, you know, a stage for that is a TED Talk, right? Like, uh, that would be, you know, a thing I can aim toward. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I think I'm going to keep on treating these small presentations as practice. And then when the opportunity to submit a proposal for a TED Talk, I will sign up for it, and then I'll figure out my topic later Um but it's on my radars, and I set that goal. I set. I usually set goals based on events and work my way backwards. Mm -hmm. I don't know that other people do. Some people do, like, the next foot in front, you know, that kind of thing. I'm more like big picture, like, you know, like, I was going to do a podcast, and then I work my way backwards. Mm -hmm. Give so, yourself that deadline. Oh, uh, yeah, deadline, pressure, you know, that pressure. Yeah. Pressure, deadline, a stage, because it's almost like um, – eight mile where like if I show up on that stage, I can't choke. So yeah. I force myself to put me in situations where I can't choke. Mm -hmm. And then usually I don't, I haven't really choked, but I, you know, I'm nervous leading up to it and I follow through. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely think for either getting back into working out or doing this TED talk, I need to set an event, have that event in my calendar and work my way backwards. And that's mm -hmm. how I prioritize my goals. And that's how I prioritize everything. Um, kind of going back. Yeah, that's great. I think, too, with goal setting is that you might have, like, so say for the TED Talk, you have that end goal in mind, but that doesn't have, have to happen this year, next year. That might happen 10 years down the road. So if you know that might be a longer a longer timeline than breaking it up into smaller, more tangible things. So I know you posted about the TED Talk at Mason, so maybe just having that be your first step. Um, as soon as you check one thing off your list, then raise the bar higher, raise it higher each time until you finally get to the highest level that you want to go to. Yeah, you're a maximizer for sure. Did you do your strengths with? <laughs> yeah. Are you a maximizer? No, um, real, realist, a realist, realtor, whatever. Relator. Relator. <laughs> yeah, that means you connect to people, but I seem like somewhere in there is a maximizer. You want people to, you on the other end, you... Like, I'm a developer. I like working with people at the start and mm -hmm. get them started. Yeah. Maximizers are people that like to work with people that are already, like, pretty good mm -hmm. and want to take them to the next level. Mm -hmm. they, they want to maximize gotcha. people. All right. So, I mean, actually, I lied. My, I have, like, two questions. One, okay. and, they're, and, they're, and they're both basketball-related. Okay. Um, do you like the movie Love and Basketball? I do. Most people do. I feel like anyone that plays basketball is their dream to like marry someone that will also play basketball. That's what I say. Um, so you trying to look for a baller? That, yeah. Okay. <laughs> someone. So, so Chris, Chrissy's at the gym. Um, if you play basketball and look good, that could be the connection. There you go. I, I think mainly though, just because I love ba basketball is my first and only love, honestly. So you want someone um, to share that love? Yeah, exactly. I want them to understand why, after a long day of work, I'm going to spend three extra hours to go hoop. Like I was, I was literally there till nine o'clock on Monday night after being Where, at. Where'd the, you hoop at? On campus. I woke okay. up. I woke up and didn't come back to my house like for over twelve hours. But that's something that I will. I will waste my energy playing basketball because it's something that I enjoy so much. So I want to, I want someone to understand that love and that passion and not 
judge yeah, me for it. Shared, shared, shared interest, shared mm-hmm, hobby. Exactly. Does he have to be taller than you? Mm, preferably, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you I mean, can't I, be like a point guard. Like a, um, I'm, a, I'm six one and a half, so I know that's asking for much. But well, actually, it's not really. If he plays basketball, I mean, yeah. if he's six something, he's going to be taller than you. Yeah. That makes sense. All right, that was my one. That, that was my one basketball question. My second basketball question is: I asked this of my other last episode. My boy Alex, he played Division One uh, baseball, mm-hmm. and I asked him what was his, you know, baseball moment. You know that that I'm on the porch and I'm telling my grandkids like, back in my day, I you know this was it. This is my pinnacle of athleticism. What's your like basketball story? Like your main one you share with your yeah. future. Self and kids or whatever. Um, oh gosh, it's tough to choose. Um, the first one that comes to my mind, honestly, isn't even a basketball play, and that mm-hmm. just goes to show um, that for me, it, it, basketball was more than just a sport. It was a lifestyle for me, and it, honestly, it still is. Um, but the memory that comes to my mind is when I was in high school. My uh, my travel coach. Her name's uh, Katie Smirkaduffy, Katie Smirkaduffy Fudd now, um, and she's a local too. She's awesome. But we would go traveling, and we weren't allowed to have our phones. She would take our phones away from us, and nowadays, yeah. if you tell people that, they would just go what? nuts, right? Yeah. Like, everyone is so attached to their phones. But um, we called it going Amish. We couldn't use any technology. We couldn't mm. use our phones. We couldn't watch TV. We couldn't listen to music before games. So we would all pack in a car, and we would just sit there in silence heading to games. But afterwards, we would go home, and we would play board games. So we would play, play games together. Um, we would cook food together. So on these trips, we just really bonded. And I think that's why we had so much success as a team, because afterwards, win or lose, we couldn't go home and just sit on our phones and talk to our friends back home. We had to talk to each other. Mm. Um, and again, we had that chemistry that it worked. Um, so it's not going to work for every team, and it's not going to work for every every time frame, because nowadays I don't know if kids could get away with that, but it's something that I really enjoyed and um, and, th- and, and thankful for that, that she instilled in us, that it's about who you're sitting next to, um, not about what's on your phone. That's dope. And then what was the other one you said, too? Did you? Mm. I don't know. I thought you said more than one moment. Cause, and I think that's funny. It's so interesting because my boy Alex, his moment wasn't even an athlete thing. Yeah. His moment was when he was named a captain. That meant a lot to him. Yeah. So I guess a lot of your special moments is non-sports related. Yeah. Honestly, I, I would say my special moments are non-sports related because um, a lot of times I was a team captain my senior year, too. And I took pride in when people would come to me outside of practice for help. They needed help picking classes. They needed help with an assignment. Mm. Um, just being there for my teammates um, off the court meant a lot to me because I, I've, I've always cared about people um, in general. I've always wanted the best for people. So to be able to provide that assistance and guidance off the court would just mean the world to me that they trusted me to come to for help. That's so dope. All right. So, we, you know, this is a great episode. I'm so happy that you got on the podcast. Um, as I said, I reiterated that your energy is just uh, exu- exuberant. I try to use a big word. And I, I thought <laughs> sounds was, fancy. Yeah, sounds <laughs> exuberant, but it, it, you admit that positive energy, and I know the, the team here at Mason is so lucky to have you. Um, I know that's true, and I can speak for everyone in there. So, you know, this is my last moment of the podcast. I always give the guests an opportunity to, you know, if they have a business or side hustle or whatever, a plug of that. And then also um, some shout outs to people that mean a lot to them. And also I put a bunch of uh, links in the show notes of your your baller skills because I want everyone to see how, <laughs> how good you are at Thanks. basketball. So, um, I mean, I'll plug myself, I guess. I don't really, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't really care to shout get out, my... Shout out to myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never really cared to get my followers up. That's not something that I'm out on, <laughs> social, on social media for. But if you want to, go ahead and follow me um, at Christy MK4. Um, my middle name is K. It's actually funny. My, um, my coach, would, whenever I was in trouble, she would go, Christy K. And that was when I knew I did something wrong. Um, but yeah, so it's Christy MK4. Um, follow me on Insta, I guess. Twitter. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I do try to be. I do try to put some positive tweets out there. Um, yeah. So definitely follow me on Twitter. Um, other shout outs, just yeah, my yeah, family, yeah. my my coaches, um, everyone that's been there for me. It's really it's been it's been a journey. Everything builds upon what what your last steps were. So it's, I've had some really good building blocks. 
um, and some mentors along the way. And shout out to you, Phil, because honestly, like you said, um, the fake it till you make it, there are plenty of times that I go home from work just exhausted and mentally drained that I don't feel positive. But when I look to your to your podcast, it gives me reassurance that other people are going through struggles, that it, help, it helps me pick myself up when I listen to your podcasts because it's nice to see people uh, people around you working at it because positivity is a state of mind. It's not something that you can always have. It's something you have to work towards. Mm-hmm. There's going to be highs and lows. So um, thank you for picking me back up even at times when you don't know it. I appreciate it. My number one fan or my only fan. <laughs> <laughs> my only That's fan. not true. That's not true. <laughs> I got like two listeners out there. Shout out to y'all. <laughs> but thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for being on the episode of the podcast. Um, check her out on all those things, social media, and like I said, um, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and like the Facebook page, Spreading Positivity of Movement. Thanks for listening. <laughs>